Welcome to another Inbox segment, where I'll try and answer all your questions. First up though, a bit of housekeeping, as quite a few things have happened in the last few months. Minimum QRP is a QRP ebook that I launched last week. It's had great sales, over 300 in the first seven days, thanks to all those who bought and reviewed it. If you haven't got a copy yet, there's a link in the text below this video. A few months ago, I mentioned the Beach 4040 Award. There were quite a few favourable comments, but so far we haven't had any applications. Get on air and make some contacts and see if you can qualify by the end of the year. If you're in the Melbourne area, in a few weeks' time, we have QRP by the Bay. On Saturday, November 14, it's 3pm here at Chelsea Beach. The venue is right near the Chelsea Life Saving Club and there's adequate shade if it's a warm day. And if you have kids, there's a playground nearby. This is a piece of home brew I've neglected to show. Built by Jeff VK2 AVR, it's actually a trophy for the flagpole day hosted by the Manly Warringah Radio Society. And the trophy was posted in a flat pack that would do IKEA proud. As always, my magnetic loop videos continue to get many comments particularly the larger loop made of copper tubing. Gordon Freeman wanted a step-by-step -step guide. The nearest to that you'll get is on the W2BRI website, where there are step-by-step -step detailed instructions, including photos of how to build a large magnetic loop. As for bending the copper, Paul G wanted to know how I did it. Well, there's actually two types of copper. There's fairly stiff, or there's flexible, or annealed copper tubing. I used the latter, and was easily able to bend it by hand. Harold, K7ILO, and one or two others, asked about the dimensions for the fine-tuning section of the magnetic loop. That's the one where I used two pieces of printed circuit board to form a capacitor. The dimensions are not critical. The main thing is that there's enough variation between minimum and maximum capacitance for you to cover the frequency segment that you desire. The boards that I used were almost square, around 7 or 8 centimetres. There is a big response to the circuit assembly methods. Definitely many different ways that people have, whether they're prototyping or building a finished product. Throwing tennis balls up in trees to put up a wire antenna. Yep, I agree that having wire sticking out of the ball would look a bit odd, especially if you're taking it on as luggage on an aircraft. Something made of nylon rope might look a bit more innocuous. If you've got an old totem tennis set, maybe you could use the ball and string from that. Carsten Bauer wanted to know if any old Dick Smith catalogues are online. That follows up from the video where I reviewed a few, showing things like computers, radio gear, kits and more. Well, I don't know of any site for Dick Smith catalogues, but there are some sites for Tandy or Radio Shack catalogues. The American range of products is slightly different to ours, but there's still a lot of overlap. I'll find a link to it and include it in the description below. Barry O'Grady reported success with an LIPD. That is a short range, low power UHF transmitter that you don't need a license for. He got three kilometres from a Dick Smith 434 MHz unit, which put out around 20 milliwatts. I recently described and drew a circuit of a simple phasing SSB transceiver. Andrew Woodfield pointed out an error. Yes, an earth connection was missed out in the RF phase shift network. So, if you've drawn it yourself from the video, please correct it. A while ago, I did a video of those generators that come with rechargeable wind-up torches. Spiderfly wanted to know whether you could fit two of them together and get a higher voltage. Yes, you definitely could, just like with connecting batteries in series. You might have to come up with an ingenious gearing mechanism or use two hands to crank it. There was a good response to the video introducing the minimum QRP book. Just to make it clear, you don't actually need to own a Kindle to be able to read an e-book. You can download free software for reading on your home computer. Digger D reckoned I missed the point of QRP. His idea of QRP is running half a watt to an indoor antenna, but personally I prefer something with a bigger chance of success. 
there's no right way of doing QRP. In Minimum QRP, I talk about the various strands that make QRP as diverse and interesting as it is. In answer to Chris Fredrickson, I had a lot of fun with the UHF transmitter modules, but haven't got around to using the receiver modules, even though I've got one or two. I'm pretty sure they'd work okay when receiving voice transmissions, but you would need some audio amplification before connecting a speaker. Just something simple like an LM386 should be okay. Quite a few people liked the video I did of the AWA building and other radio historical attractions in Sydney. In answer to Dogpipe, I don't know for sure, but I suspect the antenna on the AWA building is not in use. Ivy Bells wanted to build a 2 metre CW transmitter, but didn't find many circuits on the web. If my memory serves me correctly, there is a design in solid state design for the radio amateur by Dimore and Haywood. Another thing I'd suggest is look up FM transmitter circuits from the early 1970s. There, they often had a crystal controlled transmitter that was multiplied to the desired frequency on 146 MHz. Using one of those designs on CW is simple. Just build all the RF stages, but don't include the FM modulator or the microphone amplifier. Then find a way of keying the circuit, possibly by switching the power supply to the driver and final amplifier stages. The sticking point these days is crystals. Unless you're dead lucky and have something in your junk box that multiplies up to a suitable frequency, you will need to get one made, and that can be quite expensive. One possibility is to search online for commonly available computer crystals, say 16, 18 or 24 megahertz. If you build a low capacitance oscillator using one of those crystals, you should be able to achieve a slightly higher frequency than that marked on the crystal can. It might be only a couple of kilohertz above, but when you multiply that up to 144 megahertz, you will get a frequency safely within the two motor band, like 144.020 or similar. The basic stages you'll need are a crystal oscillator, multiplier stages and a final amplifier. Four or five transistors will get you something in the tens of milliwatts range. And with a good antenna at both ends, you'll be surprised at the distances you'll work. But don't expect random contacts. This sort of thing, like microwaves, is a very niche interest, and you'll probably need to prearrange them. This has been another inbox segment. As always, leave your questions below, and I'll answer them next time. And don't forget minimum QRP. If you haven't got yours, follow the link below.